story I want to tell you begins with a teenage crush. Back in the 90s, I know, I know, I was madly in love with Kurt Cobain from Nirvana. But I was also vaguely obsessed with another pale, skinny, angst young man. But Ivan was different. Ivan didn't hang around in the coffee shops of Seattle. He was interned in a Russian gulag. He also wasn't real, but when has something like not but being a work of literary fiction ever got in the way of true teenage romance? I carried this copy of A Day in Ivan's Life around in my back pocket, rather pretentiously, for about six months. And it led me to Warm Point Library, where I started to read everything about and by Ivan's creator, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And it was there, amongst the mills and boom and the eclectic collection of audio tape that you could lend from the library in those days, that my lifelong admiration for those who speak out, who challenge consensus, who speak for those who can't, and who go against the grain, was born. So I want to tell you that I love dissidents. And I was really worried about saying that to you tonight, because in this place, the term dissident has become so corrupted and loaded that I was worried about being misquoted and probably sacked. Um, <laughs> but it's true, I do. And like the hippie that I am, I also love peace and democracy. And it sounds counterintuitive, but dissent is crucial for peace and democracy to flourish. Dissent is crucial for social progress. No good idea, no solution to a problem, no answer to a social ill was ever brought about by people only speaking to those who agree with them. Benjamin Franklin, a dissident of his day, told us that if everyone is thinking alike, then no one is thinking. There are two golden rules in the dissident playbook for the kind of dissenters that I love and I'm in praise of. They're written by the two poster boys, really, for the non-violent protest movement, Dr. Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi. The first golden rule in the non-violent dissident playbook is buried in the speech of Dr. King's I Have a Dream, the text of his I Have a Dream speech. 50 years ago today in Washington, or today, this year, not today, I'm not that good, in Washington, Dr. King directly addressed the members of his audience who had come from prison and he said to them, in the process of gaining our rightful place, let us not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Speaking directly to those men, he went on to add, and if you let me read this because it's beautiful, let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high planes of dignity and respect. Second really long quote that I don't expect you to read comes from the second poster boy, Mahatma Gandhi. And really what this quote talks about is positivity, because that's the second golden rule of true dissent. You offer an alternative. Dissenters have ideas. They have something to add. Meanness of spirit, complaining for the sake of it, catching people out, enjoying other people's faults, is not what real dissent is about. Dissenters have ideas, and that's what makes them so exciting. So just to be really clear, this is not the kind of dissent I'm in praise of tonight. But this wonderful woman very much is, and how amazing, I did this about a month ago, how amazing she's in Belfast or somewhere today. The kind of dissenters I'm in praise of don't do this, but they very much do this. From the Enlightenment, through to Tiananmen Square, to the Velvet Revolution, to the campaign for workers' rights and equality on this island, to space travel, super colliders, penicillin, and evolution, dissenting voices have been the people propelling society forward. And Belfast can lay claim to huge parts of that proud heritage, because here's the thing, we are really good at this. <laughs> Belfast people have been leading lights in two of the most important social movements of all time, the slave, ending the slave trade and votes for women. In 1814, William Wilberforce's campaign in the UK Parliament to eliminate slavery was gaining ground. But the strongest opposition was still coming from the business community who were making an economic case for the retention of slavery. Like all good dissidents, Wilberforce knew that often to win an argument, rather than be seen to protest against something, you need to engage with the people who disagree with you at their level. So he looked around for an economic argument. And that came in the form of a book from Belfast, which, which explained to Wilberforce that the abolition of slavery would not be ruinous to trade, and the author suggested that it would appeal to those who were deaf to the moral appeal. 
That didn't come from a Quaker or a left-wing revolutionary, but it came from the Privy Councillor and Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Lord Castlereagh. Every campaign needs an excellent slogan. In, in Belfast, despite our importance as a port, we didn't have a direct involvement in the slave trade. There was no Belfast slave trading company, and that's part of our maritime heritage I'm so proud of, and probably a wee bit more than that we built some swanky ships. And at the time, a group of men met to establish a Belfast slave trading company. The dissident voice of the day, Thomas McCabe, spoke out with probably one of the greatest campaign slogans of all time, May God eternally damn the soul of the man who subscribes the first guinea. And it didn't happen. 1800s Belfast was also home to the wonderful Isabella Todd. And, I, and another twist of fate, Isabella was discussed and talked back this afternoon, and there's a TV programme about her on Sunday. I couldn't believe it when I heard it. Um, so yeah, so Isabella was a fascinating woman. She arrived here from Scotland, and she was really proud of the fact that her ancestors had signed the Solemn League and Covenant. She was a really strong advocate for the rights of girls and women in education, in health, and in politics. She was a strong advocate of the temperance movement, and she formed um, the first Belfast Women's Temperance Society. And she was also an intellectual who wrote for the Northern Whig. And how ironic that the Northern Whig's offices are now bar, given <laughs> Isabella's focus on temperance. Um, but her work, um, she was regarded as probably one of, the, one of the leading figures, probably the leading figure, of the suffragette movement in Ireland. Um, and her work was rewarded when women in Belfast received the vote 11 years before their sisters in the rest of the island. There were dissidents, trailblazers and inspirations a million miles away from the negative, violent and intimidating connotations of that word today. In the 1960s, the civil rights movement here espoused the same non-peaceful protest as Dr King was talking about in the United States. In the 70s, groups of young people, some of them in this room now, united in places like the Harp Bar, who they dissented from the violence and they had a vision of their alternative Ulster. In the 80s and 90s, civil society organisations gathered people together after each new atrocity to give voice to those who dissented from the violence and wanted to find another way. And we need that other way more than ever today. We need those voices stronger than we have before. Social, environmental and economic problems we face have remained the same for about 50 years. You know the areas, the families and the people. They've stayed the same. They face poverty, disadvantage, unemployment, educational unattainment. In 2011, a World Bank, ref Bank report confirmed what we already know in Northern Ireland, that there's a symbiotic relationship between social and economic justice and peace building and conflict transformation. Strong, legitimate governments that offer their citizens peace, security and jobs and justice are much more likely to be able to break cycles of violence or deal with external pressures. We need those dissident voices and we need them now. If you agree with what a picture, with Albert Einstein and what lovely company to be in, that unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of truth, if you agree with me that dissent is crucial for our fragile politi political experiment to flourish, then you need to develop a thick skin. No dissident ever had an easy ride. Like me, you'll be dismissed as a dreamer, utopian, naive, although some of those I kind of can live with, I guess. You might be a conspiratist, unpatriotic, or perhaps worst of all in this, this place, anti the process. Because if you're not completely with us, then you must be against us. And of course we know, because of the golden rules, that the opposite is true. Ever since Galileo looked through this telescope, dissenting voices have been steadying their nerves, dealing with their sweaty palms, standing up and saying, you know what lads, I can almost prove that the earth isn't flat. They risked their liberty, and Galileo was, was dismissed as um, a heretic by, from the church. They risked their liberty, they risked their reputation, but they've also achieved huge social change and made things happen for the better, like the amazing, amazing Doreen Lawrence, who stood up for a choice that she knew, took on a whole system, and changed things forever. So, if you're proud of our history of dissent, if you have a vision of an alternative Ulster, if you want to speak out 
with constructive ideas by the dissenting voice against the consensus. Above all, if you believe that as a people of this place, after all we've been through, we deserve better, I want to stand with you and say dissent. It's our word and we want it back.